All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Today's talk is about um, building reliable cross-cloud Kubernetes clusters on spot instances with Drafter and PBM. And I realize it's quite a mouthful. It's quite a lot. So we're going to take this step by step. First of all, we're going to start with commoditization, that fundamental idea why you would want to do something like that. Then we're going to take a look at PVM, which is an interesting piece of technology we're going to be using to start VMs inside of VMs without hardware acceleration support on them and without nested virtualization support. We're going to take a look at Silo, a Lupo Labs project to migrate a lot of data between hosts very efficiently. <laughs> and we're going to take a look at Drafter, which is an open source project, again by Lupo Labs, that combines the two tools into a single framework. Then we will take a look at Conduit, which will take care of our network migrations. And finally, we'll take a look at Architect, which is the actual more or less product that you can use today. So let's get started. A little bit about myself. I'm Felicitas. You can find me in the Fediverse if you're interested. And I, of course, work at Drupal Labs, mostly on Drafter. And yeah, let's get started. First of all, I want to talk to you about an actual quite interesting article on Corn.net called <coughs> Loss of Tech, Commoditize Your Complement. And the fundamental proposal of this article is that smart companies try to commoditize their products' complements. Now, you might be wondering what exactly a complement refers to here. <clears throat> and I think the best way to explain it is by giving you some examples. For example, if you have a car, you com your complement is usually electricity or gas. Without that, you can't do much with it. If you, have, if you build physical computers, you need software to be your complement, because without software, your hardware is just kind of a shiny piece of metal. If you're a shipping company, you need a railroad, or you need a road for it to function. So all of these companies usually require some other thing in order to function as their complement. <clears throat> now, this might seem a bit abstract in terms of tech at first, but it's a pattern that shows, over, shows up over and over again. Because companies that produce cars want to make gas cheap. Companies that ship a lot of, um, one second. <clears throat> companies that ship a lot of goods, they want cheap transport. They want rail to be available. They want a road to be available. And how do manufacturers want software to be cheap and commoditized? <clears throat> so a very famous example of this commoditization happening is actually with Netscape. For example, Netscape open sourced their browser. And a lot of people at first thought, oh, yeah, it's because of like, open source and like, a lot of like, um, ideological stuff behind it, which certainly a part of it. But also keep in mind, Netscape sells or sold servers, right? So having a free web browser is very interesting because it just can drive a lot of more people to your server. It's the complement to, to a web server. Transmeta is one of the first companies that actually hired Linus to work on Linux. And you might never have heard of them. Again, you might think it's a publicity stunt. But also keep in mind, Transmeta made CPUs, right? And the natural complement to a CPU is the operating system. So having a cheap, commoditized, open source operating system is exactly what you're looking for. And also, actually, I'm running GNOME and Fedora on the system here. Um, a lot of companies like Sun and HP paid for most of the development of that early on, right? And again, you might be thinking, oh, yeah, it's because of a different approach to software development. <clears throat> but fundamentally, you have to keep in mind that these companies used to sell, and still sell in one case, a lot of desktop computers. The complement for a computer is the operating system. And you want that to be cheap, open source, commoditized, transferable. So you might be wondering, <clears throat> I presume almost everyone here is either a software engineer or kind of adjacent in the field. So you might be wondering, if you produce software, modern software, what is your complement today? And what I would argue personally is that that's probably mostly your cloud providers. Without your cloud providers, there's not much you can do. Yes, you can, of course, host it in your basement on your home lab. But realistically speaking, most production workloads will be in public cloud. And mostly unlike AWS, Azure, GCP, the big ones, right? And you might be thinking, well, that's kind of already commoditized. But we have to look at a little bit more how, how such a commoditized comp compute um, element would actually look like. So fundamentally, I would argue that something that is a true commodity in a software in the cloud space is something that can run absolutely anything you throw in it. So if you can run it on one of these systems, you should be able to run it in a universal one. It should also be able to run everywhere. Yes, you can, of course, create like a cloud image for like every single provider, but there's subtle differences between them, subtle differences in CPU behavior. You can't move them between each other, and so on and so forth. Like, it's not really a free choice. If, if the price of GCP changes by a cent, you can't just move to GCP. That's just not going to work like from Azure or somewhere else. Um, right now, that's not really an option. But if you're thinking of, OK, let's try and imagine such a commoditized form of compute, your first thought, well, since we're talking about this, is might be containers. Um, like either, I mean, we're at KubeCon, right? So like a lot of people probably think, okay, if I want, a, uh, if I want to define my application in a way that works across cloud providers, easiest way is probably to run containers. 
But keep in mind, containers can't actually run absolutely everything. The easiest example you can always ask is, hey, is it self-hosting? Can you run Kubernetes inside of Kubernetes? Which, yes, of course, you can run the Kubelet, right? You can send in some components. There's options for virtualization. But fundamentally, um, you can't run like a custom CNI. You can't run custom CSI. You can't just load a kernel module from within Kubernetes in a nested Kubernetes cluster. So our argument would be that like, in order for it to be a true commodity, it can't just be a container. It has to be exactly what it is replacing, which is virtual machines. And thankfully, we have a lot of existing tooling around it. I mean, KVM is in the kernel, right, um, these days? And there's so many different hypervisors. We have Kimu, we have the cloud hypervisor. We Ember, like last week, just announced that they're also switching over to KVM. And Firecracker is probably also a very popular one. But there's one core problem with this KVM-based approach, and that is that it requires a vendor implementation of KVM that is usually implemented by using the um, virtualization instructions on the CPU. So for example, if you're running an Intel CPU, you probably need VTD enabled in your BIOS. If you run um, an AMD CPU, you probably need like the KVM AMD module loaded, right? And you can be sure that cloud providers will not let you do that. Unless you get a very expensive per metal machine, there's no way you can run virtual machines on top of an existing cloud provider. They will not allow you to commoditize the cloud provider way, at least until very recently. Of course, there's one workaround, that's nested virtualization. On this system, for example, something I usually use to develop, but nested virtualization really is only available on GCP in this cluster, or if you buy a very expensive metal machine, which again, we wanted to run on everything, including your regular cloud VMs that you can run today. Most people run for most of their workloads. And also nested virtualization has significant performance drawbacks. A lot of people might have, a lot of you might have tried this um, in like GCP, for example, but this is um, a pretty good, um, Bit of a definition, I think. Some syscalls have very low overhead, but anything that is like massively concurrent, that's a lot of actual compute underneath it, is going to lead to, to problems if you use it with nested virtualization. And this is where the first component I want to talk about today in order to solve this, this big commoditization question um, comes in, and that is PVM. PVM is a very recent set of patches for the Linux kernel published in February by um, Alibaba and N Group. And what it effectively implements is a KVM vendor implementation that does not require the hardware virtualization instructions and does not require nested virtualization. I won't go into too much detail today on how this is implemented. It's out of the scope of this presentation, but if you want to learn more about that later, feel free to talk to us. But fundamentally, once it knows kernel in user space, then uses a switcher in kernel space that is implemented as part of that RTC to actually do the hyper calls and stuff like that. And the most interesting thing is, I just said, there's no hardware acceleration. There's no nested word, right? The first thought might be, okay, this has to be super slow. But the, the, the actual case is, it's not actually the case. It's actually faster than KVM in some use cases. It's like with the actual official vendor implementation. BM here stands for bare metal, NST for nested. And so, for example, if you take a look at, if you take a look at the hyper call latency for, for example, KVM and PVM, um, just natively, it's like within 10% for most of the cases. And if you compare it to running Nested virtualization versus a VM with PVM's kernel module, you see a drastic difference, especially if you take a look at this in a little bit of a graph. Um, on the very left-hand side, you can see cable running with a lot of concurrent processes. If you do a lot of like compilation or see ACD in your cloud, that's something that really matters to you. And you can see the, um, the shaded, uh, the, the second um, bar from the, from the right-hand side um, is, is a nested, nested KVM. And you can see how the latency just spikes out of control when you add more threads and more heavy, heavy compute. Whereas with PVM, there's a very gradual, very slight decrease in performance. And in most cases, it's actually pretty much unnoticeable. So with PVM, what we can do, supposedly, is start a VM and send it run it inside of existing virtual machines. But can we run it, this VM, everywhere? <clears throat> <clears throat> so everywhere means a lot of things, right? We really mean everywhere. One of these interesting use cases is spot instances. If you've ever had a big AWS bill, you might have like, been tempted to like, switch on a little um, like, check mark when you create a new, a new virtual machine. It says, oh yeah, use a spot instance. Because those can be really cheap, up to 90% cheaper, simply because the, the price is, um, is um, it's just it, yeah. But it comes with a big cost. And that cost is that such a spot instance can be interrupted within two minutes on AWS and 30 seconds on GCP. Which means that at any time, it could just completely go away, all of your data is gone, so for any kind of stateful workload, that's usually not something you can use. Even with PVM, it's not that useful, right? And that's where the second component here comes in, which is live migration. And what I said with that, I'm going to introduce a new component to this, this greater puzzle, and it's Firecracker. So Firecracker you might have already used in maybe with Kata containers, maybe just for like your own uh, micro VMs. 
it's an interesting um, hypervisor based on RASVM from um, AWS. And it comes with a very, very interesting feature that I haven't seen in many other hypervisors, which is CPU templates. So if you deploy to a bunch of different cloud providers, each of them is going to have slightly different CPU instructions. Some of them have AVX virtualized, some of them don't. Some of them have different CPU frequencies, different features, different vendor IDs. So um, by using, um, by using the, the right CPU template on specific platforms, you can actually make every single, um, every single um, constants look exactly the same to the guests that you're running inside of PVM, which means that VMs become truly portable. So essentially, we can take a single VM image, deploy it on every single node, and it behaves exactly the same. It doesn't matter whether you run on EC2, AWS, or anywhere else. It's the exact same behavior. This becomes a very interesting proposal when you combine it with another Fiverr feature, which is Snapshot and Restore. Because if Snapshot and Restore and the right CPU template for your, for your specific set of heterogeneous hosts, you actually have portable snapshots. So say, for example, you're on a spot instance. You can tightly at least, snapshot it on one instance, evacuate it off the host to another instance, and just resume it there. Even if the CPU is different, even if the CPU frequency is different, even if there's different CPU IDs and different CPU features, simply because we have CPU templates and snapshot restore. And we had to make some changes to Fikrogar in order to actually get PVM to work, but they were pretty basic, and it's all open source. A link will be at the end for our specific Fikrogar fork that runs with PVM today. Now, snapshot restore is interesting. But keep in mind, Snapshot Restore is a quite expensive operation. Keep in mind, we have 30 seconds, maybe, to evacuate. So um, just Snapshot Restore is kind of useless in the context of spawn instances when the host can go away. Um, because we have to dump a lot of data, right? Every single time. The entire memory has to be dumped. With, um, with our patches, though, we have implemented a way to basically do continuous snapshotting as the virtual machine is running. And we take care of, and take care of this by using map shared basically letting the kernel sync back changes asynchronously to the underlying snapshot as it is running without having to stop time and without having to, to basically, um, and, and without having to, um, having to dump everything to disk, which makes it very, very fast. But again, um, there's a lot more information on this later, so let's just, uh, just continue. But I just argued, if you write the changes to a file, now we're migrating across instances though, so files aren't particularly useful. You just don't have enough time to migrate it in 30 seconds over to the next host, right? That is the next component, Silo, which is our open source storage engine, comes into play. Silo creates a virtual file. Actually, it's a, it's a block device that we mount somewhere, but it behaves as a file. And essentially, Silo is able to track changes that that Firehugger <coughs> or the kernel dumps from our map memory region into, um, a, um, into, the, into that uh, data plane. And we can then use this data plane to migrate between the nodes very, very efficiently. And we can amortize most of the startup. There's a peer-to-peer -peer mode directly where basically we can take a existing snapshot that's currently running, we can serve the snapshot, and then migrate it in with a hybrid pre and post copy migration. Or we also have the option to continuously synchronize that snapshot up to S3 as it is running, basically creating a continuous stream of backups that we can amortize and stream in once it is gone. So using all of this technology, we're able to actually evacuate off much, much more quickly than 30 seconds from a snapshot or from a census that is going away. And another interesting feature of, um, of uh, Silo is that it can actually forward um, forward disks as well into the guest using a, using a guest kernel module and a host kernel module. Usually you might do this with VirtualFS, but VirtualFS has a few drawbacks performance-wise, mostly because it's a fuse. With this pure VFS implementation in actual kernel space and a VSOC module for zero copy, this gets very, very fast and it allows you to, to do a lot more interesting things. That's the compute part. Now we're going to talk about Drafter. Drafter takes the components I mentioned so far, data plane and Firecracker, and puts them into one single component. It's also an open source project, by the way, under both of them are HEBL, and you can just use that today. And what Drafter provides you is a very simple and easy to use library to start virtual machines with PVM, Firecracker, exactly on the setups we just mentioned. You can see here, like, for example, resuming a snapshot is literally just you call resume on it, and it just takes care of all of the heavy lifting for you. Um, Drafter also allows you to go in and actually create guest services. So you can script your VMs in the way you might do with containers. You can talk to the guest VM with VSOC, you can call IPCs. For example, if you want to like set the guest MTUs or execute a command, this is actually a super primitive proxy implementation, like kind of like a reverse proxy. It's very easy to do with this kind of library. But it's more than just that. Drafter also is a reference implementation, CLI-wise, for um, the library, right? So we have a NAT in there and a port forwarding tool, so you can start networking environments. We have a liveness check that can notify the host when the snapshot should be taken. And we have an agent that can um, basically um, run commands out of the guest depending on things that change on the host and the other way around. We have a snapshotter tool. You just pass in your blueprint. You get out a snapshot in, like a, in a second or so. 
we have a runner, or sorry, a packager, which can create a universal redistributable package for your running application with its state that you can then copy to any host on the world and resume there with any will just work, the state will be consistent. We have the runner, of course, which actually runs the, the, these packages. And we have the registry and the mounter, which can serve these packages, these universal packages, um, across the instances, and then mount them in, stream them in, basically. So you don't have to like, download the entire um, image first and start it, you can actually stream it in while you're doing it, which is a lot faster than, than doing it the other way around. And finally, the peer, which combines a lot of this functionality into a single component. A peer can take a local snapshot, start it, make itself migratable over the network, and when you point out a peer at this peer, it just migrates to itself, or sorry, to the destination, of course, in this use case. Um, and you can also, of course, stop the VM, snapshot it, so on and so forth. But with all this out of the way, very, very abstract, so switch over to a demo, which in this case, it's, there's two demos, this is the first one, and this one will be a live migration of Valky, which is the Reddit successor um, between cloud providers and um, between cloud providers with Drafter. And for that, I will quickly switch over to screen monitoring. Hope that works, perfect. Okay. And as a part of the preparation for this, I have uh, provisioned a bunch of um, cloud instances. We have some, there's someone here over on AWS, some on Azure, some on GCP, and these are just regular old cloud instances. There's no bare metal, no nested virtualization. This is also all linked later. There's a Terraform, you can a Terraform um, template you can run to actually start all of this. Now, um, I've picked a few hosts um, for the specific demo. So there's a few hosts here running on the East Coast. There's one in AWS, there's one in the central US on Azure, and there's one running in GCP. We also have one running in Hillsboro for Head Start, but we won't be using that today for the demo. And I'm just gonna get started here. So first of all, I wanna show you that it's actually running, not on bare metal, but it's actually virtualized. I've prepared this little script that will just run, off, run over all of our nodes. And you can see over here, this is running inside of the, so we run system detect vert. So this is actually like properly virtualized. It's not bare metal. And you can see here, for example, this one is using the proprietary Amazon hypervisor. This one is using Hyper-V. And the last two, this is GCP and Headstar. These are using KVM. So these are completely different, um, they're completely different hypervisors under the hood, right? So usually if you want to like live microbean that, pretty much impossible. And you can also see different processor types. It's not the exact same thing. Different core counts, different even address sizes and different uh, CPU speeds. So usually not something you would be able to migrate around, right? So what I'm doing the first is I'm gonna start a bunch of services on this. And I should mention, um, this is a live demo. I'm on conference Wi-Fi, so things here might break. I have a video in case that happens. And I will also be linking the entire reproduction steps that you can run at home for, for all of this um, at the end. But let's just hope at first that it just works. Wi-Fi seems to be working well, so fine. Okay, I will also start the port forwarding here. We are forwarding um, Redis to port 333 from the normal port. This is actually based on the drafter net and the drafter forwarder tooling I showed you earlier. Here we are. That's all running. And yeah, now we have to just follow this little, little guide I wrote. And what we're gonna be doing here is, first of all, I'm gonna create a snapshot, and I'm starting it on the first, first node. So I'm creating it immediately, immediately resuming it. I'm using the T2A template for Firecracker here, which is exactly what, um, which is, the, it is common across all AMD Milan CPUs. So as long as it's newer than AMD Milan, they all look the same from the VM's perspective. As you can see here, the snapshot is currently happening. You might see that the snapshot itself takes a while, right? That is the reason why you can't just use snapshot restore for this kind of live migration stuff. It's just too slow. There's too much IO happening. So this is how long it takes to start it. And there we go. We have our thing running. And we now have Valky running on here. And if I jump back into the top here, we have a little open source tool, open source tool called Latency, which is creatively named, but essentially just connects to the Valky or Redis instance and basically runs a few commands as the connection is running without breaking the connection. So in this case, I can simply start it. Sorry, I put the wrong port in here. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we forwarded it to 333, not the actual Redis part. There we go, and it works. And like, yeah, the ping is not that great. Again, the servers are on the East Coast right now. We are on conference Wi-Fi, but just bear with me for a second. So we now have this VM running. And again, this is a universal snapshot, right? Um, this is currently running inside of a nested VM on AWS EC2. Now we want to take this um, virtual machine and we want to migrate it. In our case, we actually, we can pick any provider here that we really want to migrate to. I'm gonna pick um, Azure for the next one. So um, again, different CPU type, everything is completely different between these two systems. systems. And I'm simply pointing this one, um, this peer to the last peer using a listening address, right? That's all I have to do. And I'm just gonna paste this over here. And you will see that the live migration is starting. It's pretty fast. You can see everything continues to run. Um, while this is doing, there should, shouldn't be any spikes in this, this demo as well. 
and you can see that like it's slowly migrating all the data over. Now, usually, if you have a if you have deployment on spot instances, you would use S3 to continuously synchronize it before it's even been interrupted, right? So you only migrate the smallest amount of data at the end peer to peer. For this demo, though, we're doing it fully peer to peer just for the sake of simplicity. So as you can see, we're migrating something like I think it's 30 gigs between these two nodes. The, this is a, a four CPU cores and two gigs of RAM, not the biggest VM, but this is what we were able to fit inside of our AWS quota in this use case. <laughs> so um, yeah, should be done any second now. And this is over. This is over like a public internet link. So this is like less than a gigabit in terms of speed. So that's why it's taking a little bit longer to actually copy everything over. But you can see while this is happening, everything just kind of continues to run. And what you will see is actually so we can see the live migration happening over here. You get specific M sync spikes, um, but fundamentally everything keeps running. There's no data loss. However. Once you migrate it over, you see that this breaks at first, right? Which makes sense. We move from host A to host B, different IP address. So what do we do next? We use the IP address of our Azure server. Oh, I forgot the uh, first octet. Here we go. And we restarted. And voila, we have taken a snapshot that we started on, on, on AWS. We have moved it over to Azure and resumed it over there. And it just keeps running. And just for some results, this took about 66 milliseconds here. Usually it's faster. You will see this in data demos as well. There's a bunch of RTTs that could come into play with this specific demo. But yeah, we've moved now, we've moved now from AWS to Azure. Let's move further. Let's just move to, let's see what, what else I cooked. I think the next demo is GCP. Yeah, so let's take that snapshot, that running virtual machine, and we're just going to migrate it right over to GCP. Again, this one actually has like, like, uh, like 2 gigahertz uh, CPU. Like it's a completely different vCPU. But yeah, we can see again. Same story. It's now copying the data over. This is actually this server is running in Iowa. The other one is running in, uh, like I think, Virginia. So it's just a little bit of a, a little bit of an RTT here at play. But as you can see in a second, we are migrating um, the blocks over. Everything just kind of keeps running, and I'm going to pre-prepare this time latency to switch its IP address over to the destination. While this is happening, a little bit tight on time, so I might have to skip a few slides. Just a second. But yeah, essentially right now what you're seeing is just like a bunch of data being transferred over. It's like 30 gigs, so it just takes a while. And usually you would amortize this using S3 instead of running it peer-to-peer -peer at the time where you're migrating. And here we go. It's doing the final migration steps. And you can see again, our original host stopped. It has resumed on the other end. This time it took 350 milliseconds, even though this is like across the American continent, right? And we can go in here. We can use our new destination IP address. And we can resume it. And voila, we have migrated our live data. All the data is consistent. The CPU set is exactly the same. And again, this is on without instrumentation across different cloud providers. So that is our first demo. Let's quickly jump over to join our displays again. Oops. These are not supposed to be on that screen. <laughs> uh, one second. Here we go. Voila. So this was the first demo. We've migrated, I've migrated my Valky, as I've heard this, between cloud providers on top of their regular um, instances as virtual machines. Um, but you might have noticed we had to change the IP address, right? This was the live migration in theory, but from the user's perspective, the connection dropped. That is where our next connection, our next um, um, idea here comes in, the next component, which is conduit. Conduit allows us to live migrate not just like the CPU state, the disks, all of the like registers, all that kind of stuff. It also allows us to migrate the network connections from host A to host B with zero downtime. For example, this has very, very interesting ramifications. Um, for example, let's imagine we have a database in the EU and we have oh, sorry, a database in Canada and a server in the EU, right? If we want to migrate the, if I can want to migrate the database over to Canada, well, the connections are going to break in two places. First and foremost, it's going to break between us and the web server, right? Since the IP address changed. And also, if you migrate something, we would expect the TCP connections to break. But also, the connection between the database and the web server has broken. What Conduit effectively does is it can migrate those connections for you. So you can migrate, this applies to both egress and ingress connections. So, for example, if your server is making an outbound request during a migration, that request will not be interrupted. If you are connected, like with, with like, uh, with like, I will show later again with Redis, for example, or with something, something like, like, Net, like Netcat, or you're streaming data, you're doing a video conference, whatever. All of that kind of stays, kind of just like continues to work. There's an, an actual migration of the, underlying, of the underlying connections. And that means you can just kind of move it at random. If, 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 you're, if you're not really worried about latency, for example, and today you notice, okay, spot instances and like, I don't know, Azure's like US central region are super cheap. 
and if it's just doing a lot of, lot of, a lot of offload, offload processing, you can just move it over. And once it gets cheaper back where you're originally running them, you can just move them over again. If you notice that a spot instance on, for example, GCP is cheaper than on AWS, you can just move it over to AWS. Um, and there will be no interruption to your inbound connections, your outbound connections, or any CPU state. From the user's perspective, it will be completely transparent. And the product that allows you to take all of these individual components, conduit, drafter, PVM, FICO, and so on, and wrap them into a nice API, a nice reusable actual product, is Architect. And Architect is exactly what I'm going to be using in a second demo of today, where we will take a Kubernetes cluster and we migrate the entire Kubernetes cluster between cloud providers using Architect. So again, one of the demos of the things I mentioned in the beginning is that a Kubernetes piece of compute can run absolutely everything. And when I mean everything, I mean everything. You can run a Kubernetes cluster inside of it, right? And that Kubernetes cluster should be able to run absolutely everywhere. So what we're going to be doing next is exactly that. We're going to start a Kubernetes cluster inside of Architect. And for that, let me mirror my screen again. Let's hope that the demo got... Uh, also, I'm happy with the <laughs> second demo. <laughs> and again, just to clarify, I have... Um, created a bunch of um, virtual machines here earlier. It's a lot of time to start. And you can see we have a bunch, we have some of them in AWS, we have some of them over here in Azure, some of them in GCP, some of them in, in other environments. And, what you want, and you can see again, all of these run at a specific hypervisor, there's no nested virtualization, this is not bare metal. These are running VMs on VMs, using PVM and Architect. So yeah, our first step of, of business, of course, is to actually start a Kubernetes cluster. For that to work, I'm going to quickly start two components. Actually, I'm going to start all of them while we're already here. So these are exactly the five nodes I just showed you earlier that I'm connecting to. Again, I'm excluding Hetzner for the specific demo. And we can see everything starting up. While this is running, I'm going to quickly configure the local CLI for Architect, which is called Arc. And we just jump in here. Already configured it. There we go. Now, the first, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start the Kubernetes tester, as I just mentioned. And again, all of this is, um, is documented, so if you want to try it at home. So first of all, I'm going to start a server. Again, T2A template for CPU cores, two gigs of RAM. Very small, but for this demo, again, it's what we could fit in within the, the quota. That is being started right now. Basically, we're creating the snapshot, first of all, first and foremost. Take a little bit of time. And again, like, like when you see these kinds of things taking longer, like this initial snapshot, that is exactly why you cannot just use snapshot restore with um, sponsors. You really need that live migration piece, because it just takes too long to happen. Um, yeah, and the big benefit, of course, of something that separates the snapshot restore from the live migration piece, like Architect does, is like you can actually amortize something like this. You can just pre-create your snapshots for Kubernetes instances. When you actually start a new cluster, you just take that snapshot and you resume it, which is instantaneous, like 100 milliseconds. So you can add like a new Kubernetes node, for example, in like 100 milliseconds to it, which is kind of a useful feature. And actually, that is actually safe in our use case as well. It's not just something you you can do. It's actually it's actually safe as far as I'm aware. All of the like crypto stuff. Um, gets re restarted. All right, um, I'm starting our instance, and you can see on the left-hand side, we have just started our factory instance. It resumed in, like, I think 100 milliseconds over here, and I'm quickly going to grab the we're running upstream K3S inside of this, but any Kubernetes distro works. Um, so in this case, I'm just going to have to quickly unjamble this terminal. Uh, there we go. Ah, let's see how long it takes until I get the reset. There we go. <laughs> I'm just obviously going to copy out the uh, kubeconfig from our destination. Oh. It's a little bit cumbersome on the small screen. All right, so I'm just going to place this into my local dot kube config. And again, K3S usually uses localhost, so we're just going to swap this out with the IP address of our instance. And I hope this works. <laughs> there we go. We have a connection to our Kubernetes instance. Again, this is running inside of a VM, inside of a VM, in this case, I think, on AWS in this use case. And you have full access to it. This is a full K3S cluster. You can like open up a shell into here. I don't know if coordinates, I don't actually have one. You can lose the logs of stuff. It's actual upstream Kubernetes. And again, this image is actually also open source. You can retry this at home if you want to. OK, for the next thing, we have, to, we have to actually start another thing, which is, of course, an agent. So far, we have one manager, and we want to make this a multi-node cluster. So I will definitely connect to our second node now, which is running over in GCP. And you can see much the same process as last time. We started, 
the um, node will now, while it is creating the snapshot, using the liveness component I mentioned earlier, it will notify the host once it has actually connected to the upstream community server, and then it will shut itself down and is ready as a snapshot. You can see here, the node just popped up. That one is again running on GCP, completely separate node, and just connected to the first server we have started. And we're now taking a snapshot again. Usually, of course, you would amortize this. So you, you only start a snapshot once, so you don't have to create a new one each and every time. <clears throat> and once this is finished, there we go. We can actually start our cluster. Sorry, our, our worker. Our Kubernetes agent, I guess, is the correct term in K3S terminology. And there we go. Time to start. Voila, we started that. So now we have two nodes in this cluster. And this should slowly start to, start to actually pull the images while it's, while it's happening. We'll check back on this in just a second. First of all, though, I'm going to quickly prepare a small um, Kubernetes YAML file I have prepared. This is just a standard Valky pod, again, like I mentioned last time. And what we can take here is we can simply replace the node name, so we schedule it to the correct node. We jump over back to Architect. And I think by now this node, yes, it's ready. It has fully provisioned itself. And we can simply hit Apply over here. You can see the pod number go up to two. There we go. And now we're starting a pod inside of a Kubernetes cluster running across cloud providers on, on, like in this case, normal cloud VMs, right? You can see it just started. We have published a port earlier, so we can now access it in the same way we did earlier. My uh, touchpad has just decided to stop working. I cannot click. Um, give just one second. More luck? Yes, there we go. We're back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so the first thing we can, of course, do, we can point latency um, again at our little tool, which you will be doing. Uh, right over here. Yeah, just going to replace the destination IP address with the one we were using earlier. And this is just the first node in the, the test I showed you earlier. And here we go. We have latency running. We can connect to the server as we just started instead of Kubernetes off the VM from the outside. And the next thing I want to do is I want to live migrate this node to a different system. Um, oop. And so first of all, I'm going to make the node migratable. We're going to do this manually here just to show like, what is actually happening in the hood. Usually you just type in um, migrate from. And we will quickly replace it down here. I will switch over to the next host. So we're now migrating from GCP over to AWS. We're going to clean up this node just to make sure that we don't have anything left over. And finally, we start the actual migration. As you can see now, this system is migrating over here and migrating to this node. And you can see the connection just kind of keeps working. I really hope last time we had some, we had some hangups because we were using a mobile hotspot. I hope this doesn't happen this time around. But this tool uses a single connection, right? So this is like the connection should now not break between the, between the migrations. Still going to take a little bit of time just because there's a lot of data and we're not using S3 in this case. This is purely peer-to-peer -peer in this case. We're not amortizing the, the continuous assumption. But you can see while this migration is happening, everything just kind of keeps working. We can, like, we can send more new commands here. You can, I don't know, go into the VM. The, the Kubernetes cluster is still running, right? Like we have to node up here. The status is, 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 is running. Everything just kind of keeps working. And now over here, we can see that the final migration stuff is happening. And you can see over here that it's going to resume in just a second, hopefully. Uh, are we, yeah, and usually that spike is much, much shorter. But you can see over here, we have just moved that node between AWS or to GCP. We get about 1.3 seconds. Usually that's more like in like 50 milliseconds. I can actually show you how long it actually takes to, to, to resume this node over here. So the actual resumption time was 216 milliseconds. Everything else we have here is just RTT from us locally accessing it, right? So if you were a client connected to this node, we could now have moved it between cloud providers with zero downtime, technically speaking, on spot instances, right? We also have more, uh, technically speaking, we would have more demos now, but I just see we only have a very short amount of time left, so I'm really going to skip the rest of the migrations. But this, again, this works the exact same way if you're migrating over to AWS, your own on-premise infrastructure, or, oh, sorry, or anything else. Um, I'm not sure what's happening here. I'm just going to use this view. <laughs> so, yeah, that is fundamentally what, um, what this new commodified computer can do. It can run absolutely anything, including all of Kubernetes, and it can run it absolutely anywhere and move between them at any time, depending on what the price changes, whenever you kind of feel like it. And there's absolutely no downtime between you moving from A to B, so there's pretty much no cost associated with you migrating from A to B anymore. No reconfiguration, no drop connection, stuff like that. We also have, as part of Architect, an actual native Kubernetes integration. Not part of this talk. If you're interested, just feel free to talk to us afterwards. All you have to do, just register a single runtime class. Use the runtime class in your normal, average Kubernetes um, pod, everything which is going to work, including storage, like I mentioned with Silo earlier, including networking. 
And for example, you can run like Zoonotic on here. This also works for UDP traffic, not just TCP. You can use any protocol for what we, we don't really care about that. And you can also run Valky with it. And again, if you want demo of this, just let us know. And of course, the final one, I can't do this demo now. Don't have enough time for it. But you can also use this for like CICD, which is a very user instance. For example, you can, we have a dashboard on Arcade Run. You can just sign in with your AWS account and your GitHub account. You can switch out the, the, uh, the hosting to, your, uh, to, to run on Architect instead of the normal Kubernetes runners. And then you just schedule them over the spot instances. If the spot instance dies during a build, not a problem. You just migrate over to the next one and to the next one, the next one. If GCP becomes cheaper than AWS, we just move to GCP. If your own on-premise infrastructure gets cheaper, we can just move over there. And yeah, as a very short recap, we took a look today at what commoditized compute could look like. Then I looked at PVM to do the underlying actual um, virtual machine startups and the VKM implementation. The silo for data transfer, very fast ones between them. The drafter as a tool that combines all these things together into a single unified library. We looked at Conduit, which can actually take not only the CPU virtues and stuff, but the actual network the connections between them and migrate them without downtime um, while the live migration is happening. And that architect, which takes all these things together, grabs them on a pretty nice API and makes them available for you to use. And yeah, all links and resources, including a complete re reproduction guide to this, all open source repositories and sign up links, including my script for this demo if you're interested is all under this link. And these slides are also up on Scat if you can't um, take the screenshot in here in time. And um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it for this talk. Thank you very much for listening. I hope this was uh, interesting. And yeah, if you wanna follow me again on Blue Skype, feel free to. Um, and of course, fundamentally, if you wanna use this stuff for your own actual product, take a look at architect.run. We, we have a waitlist over there. You can just sign up and we will text you once we have um, CSED stuff running, which is actually pretty around the corner now. The Kubernetes integration, all of it, feel free to, to just check out that link. And yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs>